Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, I'd be grateful for short and succinct questions and indeed answers. Uh, we now move to portfolio questions on rural affairs, food and environment. Question one, Michael McMahon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what work it is conducting in association with the Scottish Environment uh, Protection Agency to ensure high regulatory standards in waste management. Secretary Richard Lockhead. The Scottish Government and the Scottish Environment Protection Agency work closely in all areas of waste management regulation to ensure these high standards are in place across the sector. For example, the Regulated Reform Scotland Act 2014 provides SEPA with new powers of investigation, new sentencing options for the court and the new offence of causing significant environmental harm. We also recently announced a review to be conducted jointly with SEPA of legislation and guidance relating to the use, relating to the use of sewage sludge. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. Can I ask if he is aware that at a round table session hosted by the Justice Committee last year, concerns were raised about the increasing presence of illegal operators in the waste management industry and about access to public contracts? The former Cabinet Secretary for Justice noted that the difficulty uh, there was in the absence of formal criminal proceedings, intelligence regarding potential links to serious organised crime and that this could not be taken into account in awarding these contracts. Can the Cabinet Secretary give an update on supporting the sharing of information between agencies and the impact that this is having on prosecution rates for environmental crime? Cabinet Secretary. The member raises an important issue in terms of illegal operators and waste management and the huge problems they cause for the regulators and Scotland's environment. As you will know, tackling environmental crime has been a big priority for all the agencies and the Scottish Government over the last few years. And of course, we set up the, the Environmental Crime Task Force, and indeed there was a, a conference on environmental crime just in November late last year. So there is more sharing of information between the agencies. If there's a specific issue that the member is concerned about, please write to me and I'll pass that to the Lord Advocate to, to address, because Lord Advocate, as well as SEPA, the Environment Agency, and the police and others are all working together to tackle environmental crime and clamp down on illegal operators. Many thanks. Jamie McGregor. Um, thank you. Does the Minister agree that the waste management sector in Scotland is important to the economy and that the vast majority of companies in it are committed to meeting the high standards in place and that therefore a partnership approach between SEPA and business is important to ensure the standards are met. Mr. Secretary. Uh, yes, I, I do agree with the, the point made by Jamie McGregor and again a lot of effort has been put in with uh, good success to ensure that SEPA are very business friendly as they have been over the last few years and many businesses I speak to in Scotland have noticed uh, the sea change in approach from the environmental regulator over the past seven years. Of course, they've got a job to do, but they should enable economic development, uh, not frustrate it, uh, and that's why they are being very proactive in working with the business community. So the partnership approach is very, very important. I accept that. Many thanks. Question two, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to help prevent flooding in urban areas. Minister Aileen MacLeod. Uh, SEPA local authorities and Scottish Water are cooperating on developing flood risk management strategies and local flood risk management plans. These will identify priorities for reducing flood risk in vulnerable areas, both urban and rural throughout Scotland. A consultation on the draft strategies and plans will be launched in March, and publication of the strategies is due in December later this year, with the local flood risk management plans following in December 2016. I thank the Minister for her answer. Paisley has dealt with over 1,400 millilitres of rain in the last few months. This has, of course, caused some flooding within the town and caused much concern with constituents. Are there any plans currently underway to improve drainage systems across the country, but particularly in uh, urban areas like Paisley? Minister. <coughs> And the Scottish Government recognises the challenge posed by surface water flooding caused by heavy rainfall, and that is why the Flood Risk Management Scotland Act 2009 has established a planning process for the sustainable management of all flood uh, risks, including surface water flooding. And we have also published guidance to assist responsible authorities in the preparation of surface water management plans to help with the management 
of surface water flooding, as by its nature, surface water flooding is too complex for any single, single organisation to address the challenge alone. And we are also uh, looking at how we can better manage surface water before it enters the sewer system or receiving water courses by allowing for more above ground storage and routing of surface water as well as increased absorption through the ground or via innovative solutions. Thank you. Alex Ferguson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Minister will be well aware, I'm sure, of the Dumfries and Galloway Council's proposal for flood prevention on the White Sands in Dumfries. She will also be aware of the considerable level of local opposition and growing level of opposition to those plans. Can I ask what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the Council about that proposal and uh, what has been their outcome? Minister. Uh, local authorities are responsible, as uh, the member Alex Ferguson knows, for developing, designing and promoting flood protection schemes as they see fit within their area, including undertaking public consultation and engagement with stakeholders. And the Scottish Government has no direct role in this process. The Theresa Galloway Council's decision-making process for determining how best to protect the White Sands from flooding are still ongoing. And indeed, I know that the Council has continued its public engagement efforts recently with model displays of the favoured scheme, which I was fortunate enough to have the chance uh, to view, and it's in Dumfries on the 26th of January. I'm also aware, very aware, that the current proposals for the White Sands have divided opinion among local residents, and have therefore asked my officials to liaise with their counterparts at Dumfries and Galloway Council and to discuss the current proposals for the White Sands. Thank you. Anne McTaggart. Thank you, President Officer. Could I ask the, the Minister um, for an update on progress with the funding and development of one of the national infrastructure projects, the Metropolitan Glasgow Strategic Drainage System? Uh, Scottish Water is investing heavily in improving its drainage and sewage infrastructure, both to improve services to customers and to reduce uh, flood risk, often in cooperation with local authorities uh, and SEPA. The Metropolitan uh, Glasgow Strategic Drainage Partnership is obviously a prime example of this sort of interagency cooperation within an urban environment, and it will result in substantial reductions in flood risk for residents of the greater Glasgow area. But I'm very happy to write to the member with a further update and to provide her with as full of information as I possibly can about that scheme. Many thanks. Question three, Joanne Lamont. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will publish the findings of its consultation on the future of land reform. Minister Aileen MacLeod. A uh, consultation on the future of land reform in Scotland closed on the 10th of February. Approximately 1,200 responses have been received from a range of organisations and a large number of individuals. We are carefully considering all the responses and we look forward to receiving the independent analysis report that we have commissioned in the coming months. In the course of March, consultation responses will be published on the Scottish Government's website where the respondent has indicated that they are content for the response to be made public. Thank you. Um, I'm sure the Minister will be aware of the long-standing commitment to and record on of the Labour Party in addressing the issue of land reform, and I certainly wish the Minister every um, power to her elbow in an area which I think we could really make a difference in Scotland. But the Minister may also be aware of the view of many who are campaigning for a transformation in land ownership in Scotland, of the need for a presumption in favour of a community right to buy, a right which the Labour Party supports. So will the Minister indicate what the Scottish Government's position is in this, a right which many believe will create significant opportunities for sustaining communities across Scotland? Minister. Can I thank the Member um, for her question and I also just want to uh, put on record that I'm very um, open. If uh, the member would wish to uh, write to me to have a, a meeting with me, I'm very happy to discuss any proposals that the Labour Party would like to bring forward. And I would say around her, our question that you know, our vision for land reform is for a strong relationship between the people of Scotland and the land of Scotland, where you know, ownership and use of the land delivers greater public benefits through a democratically accountable and transparent system of land rights that promotes fairness and social justice and environmental sustainability and economic prosperity. So I'm very keen to see you know, a fairer and a more equitable distribution of land in Scotland where our communities and our individuals can own and use land to realise their potential. Because we, we all know that Scotland's land must be an asset that benefits the many, not the few. So I'll be very keen to have a further discussion uh, with Joanne Lamont around those very issues around the land reform. Many thanks. Question for Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing in Glasgow to mark the Year of Food and Drink Scotland 2015. 
Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. Scotland's natural larder will be showcased over the next 12 months at events the length and breadth of the country, including special events supported through a dedicated £265,000 fund about raising awareness of the role food and drink plays in our cultural identity and in shaping our country's economic success. There are a range of events in Glasgow throughout the year, including a food and drink showcase event at the Drygate Craft Brewery in Glasgow, where around 100 local businesses will hear both about the opportunities available throughout the year and also hear about our Taste Our Best Quality Assurance Scheme, which recognises local businesses that are committed to sourcing local. Thank you very much. Bob Doris. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that, for that answer and for information in relation to the event at the Drygate Craft Brewery. I also noticed from the Scottish Food and Drink website there was a significant event from the 3rd of 5th, to 5th of March called Scott Hot, which would celebrate Scotland's hospitality tourism and food and drink part of six events in, in March at the SEC at this time. Can I ask if the Scottish Government made an economic analysis of what they expect the the, the cash benefit, the economic benefit, be to businesses based in, based in Glasgow and to the wider Glasgow economy. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Well, whilst I don't have figures for the benefits directly to Glasgow, clearly in terms of the benefit for Scotland, including all our communities, uh, is evidenced by the growing economic contribution of food and drink overall to Scotland over the past few years. This is a sector that is now worth £14 billion to the Scottish economy in terms of turnover alone uh, by the sector. So we believe we're still scratching the surface. And the year of food and drink is all about promoting Scotland as a showcase, uh, as the land of food and drink, uh, not only to people visiting Scotland from overseas, but people that live here in our own country and, of course, in terms of Glasgow, the people that live there. So I believe there will be huge economic benefit by sourcing more local because simply that's good for local producers, local businesses and suppliers. Uh, and of course, often, given that I just launched the in-season local food campaign this morning, which will run for the next few weeks, uh, it could be healthy, nutritious food we, we're enjoying when it's in-season, and we grow that on our own doorstep. So there's many, many benefits from the year of food and drink for Glasgow and the whole of Scotland. Many thanks. Question five, Alex Johnson. Scottish Government, what it's doing to deliver sustainable development in those rural areas that are hardest to reach? Secretary Richard Lockhead. Uh, the Scottish Government is working hard to ensure everyone in rural Scotland has the same access to the opportunities and services as urban areas. Our new Scotland Rural Development Programme will provide over £1.3 billion, hopefully, for a range of initiatives across our rural communities and will help boost our rural economy and all the development that comes with that. We are also investing over £410 million in our Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme, which will deliver fibre broadband access to 95 per cent of premises by 2018. And of course, that has been done in parallel with Community Broadband Scotland, which supports schemes in more rural areas in Scotland, more remote areas. Uh, so, of course, these initiatives will complement everything else that is happening across government, which is not time to go into just now. Alex Johnson. I thank the Minister for the answers he has given. Uh, the Minister will be aware, I am sure, that when much of the demand created for that broadband is in agricultural businesses and remote areas, which now require to connect through the internet in order to supply information to his own department. However, some of these areas are extremely hard to reach. What discussions has the Minister had with ministerial colleagues uh, in order to create a cross-ministerial uh, uh, effort to ensure that we can deliver to those hardest to reach areas alternative methods of connecting to the internet using available technology which is becoming affordable as we speak. That's it. Well, as Alec Johnson will be aware, one of the key objectives of the government that uh, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon launched a few weeks ago uh, is tackling inequality. And as part of our conversations on that, I'm sure the member will welcome the fact that we are discussing digital broadband and to ensure that tackling inequality, particularly in rural areas, is very much part of that agenda. But what I laid out in my opening remarks, I hope persuades the member we are taking this seriously. There's years and years of neglect of rolling out broadband across Scotland, but we're now addressing that and it will make a difference. In terms of farmers accessing the forms they have to fill in, which they're being urged to do online these days, there are alternative methods being made available for those who can't get online. So facilities have been made available at local agricultural offices where farmers can visit and they can submit also paper copies if required. But they can use, use online facilities at local agricultural offices if they don't have broadband in their own homes and farms. Many thanks. Question six, Mary Scanlon.
ask the Scottish Government what is being done to comply with the Habitats Directive to conserve freshwater pearl mussels in the River Spey. Mr Aileen MacLeod. Uh, the requirements of the Habitats Directive with respect to freshwater pearl mussels are delivered largely by three legislative pillars. Firstly, that pearl mussels are listed on Schedule 5 to the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 and benefit from strict protection. Secondly, the habitat quality of pearl mussels in both protected areas and the wider environment is maintained and improved under the provisions of the Water Environment and Water Services Scotland Act 2003. And lastly, competent authorities must execute the procedural requirements of the Conservation Natural Habitats Regulations 1994 in relation to the assessment of the implication of plans or projects for European sites. Thanks, Mary Scanlon. Well, as the self-styled species champion for the freshwater pearl mussel, <laughs> uh, I, I am aware of the 50% decline in their population, which in fact proves that neither the government or the public agencies have done enough to protect this species and is still not providing adequate protection, despite, despite the legislation going back as far as the Minister has said. So just how prepared is the Scottish Government for referral to the EU Court of Justice and subsequent fines for not providing adequate protection for this, uh, this species? Minister. Uh, can I uh, firstly just commend Mary Scanlon for her passion and her commitment that she's shown to the conservation of the freshwater pearl mussel and all the work that she has been doing in this regard as the Scottish Environment Link Species Champion uh, for the, uh, the freshwater pearl mussel. The significance of the decline, I, you know, I admit, is of grave concern and only became apparent in the results of recent survey work that was due to report next month. As a result, SEPA has commenced an analysis of environmental data collected over the last 10 years to establish the cause or causes, and this will inform future action, for example, under the Spay Catchment Initiative. Separate to this, the Scottish Government has asked SEPA and SNH to work together to draw together the appropriate objectives and standards for water bodies within conservation sites, and the Scottish Government will consider the need for public consultation on receipt later this year. I'm very happy uh, to meet with the member um, to discuss what further action that can be taken around the conservation of freshwater pearl mussel. Excellent. Question 7, Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with farmers or their representative on the impact of the trade, so the, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership on Animal Welfare and Food Standards. Secretary Richard Law. As the Member knows, the National Farmers Union of Scotland gave written and verbal evidence to the meeting of the European External Relations Committee on the 27th of November. This outlined their concerns about the possible implications for food standards and geographical indication labelling, amongst other things. So the Government has agreed to maintain a dialogue with NFUS as the proposals develop and will ensure that their views are fed into the negotiations. Christina McKelvey. Can, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? The Cabinet Secretary will know that farmers in my area of Hamilton, Larkhall and Stonehouse are, are extremely anxious about TTIP. And last week at the European and External Relations Committee, Lord Livingston went to great pains to suggest that all of these standards are currently exempt. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell me what reassurances he's had from the UK Government to seek the reservations from the Commission on these matters, especially in relation to animal health standards, GMO, food standards, and of course, protected name status like Scotch and Jamie uh, McGregor, my colleague Jamie McGregor's great champion of the Stornoway Black Pudden. Richard Lockhead. Well, <clears throat> as a big fan of Stornoway Black Pudding, I will ensure that this trade uh, negotiation does not harm its fantastic status. However, uh, until we see the black and white of the trade agreement, we have to make every effort to make representations to both Europe and the UK government to heed uh, the views of Scotland's farmers. I should say the European Commission has repeatedly stated that consumer health and safety and environmental standards will not be lowered and that, for example, there's no prospect of GM crops or hor hormone-treated beef being allowed into the, UK, into the EU or UK. However, as I said before, until we see that in black and white, we will keep up the pressure on the authorities to make sure that's the case. And I'll make a point of once again raising these issues with UK ministers following Christina McKelvey's uh, raising the subject today in Parliament. Thanks. Sarah Byatt. 
Can I very much welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment there and can I add to his um, pressure um, the fact that I know that Unite members are also very concerned about the impact on our own farming industry, about the pressure to cut costs and the issues he's mentioned in terms of pesticides, health and safety issues at work in Scotland in terms of processing uh, organisations that take food. So it's very much in our interest to make sure that these standards are retained and if I can ask the Cabinet Secretary if he would also be prepared to meet with uh, the Unite Trade Union who have expressed reservations about the impact on not just the workforce but the wider environment and the impact on Scottish consumers given the very high standards we have in our agricultural industry. Um, um, yes, I would be happy to meet can. representatives from Unite to discuss their concerns. I can give that pledge today. In terms, again, of the assurances we have had so far, albeit there is still some way to go in the negotiations, we have had assurances repeated to us there will be no lowering of standards in terms of uh, any trade agreement, but of course it remains a concern and the trade agreement according to European authorities is all about coherence of standards and getting rid of duplication, but we must be absolutely certain it does not lead to a lowering of the very high standards that are maintained by the Scottish agriculture and wider food industry sectors. Many thanks and we now move to portfolio questions on justice and the law officers. Question one has been withdrawn and an explanation has been provided. Question two, Chick Brodie. Yeah, thank you, Presiding Officer. I may uh, to ask the Scottish Government what the actual and contracted expenditure was for ICT systems in the police and fire services in the year 2013-2014. Secretary Michael Maths. Uh, the expenditure by the police and fire service for ICT systems in 2013-14 was 34.87 million, uh, 34 million and 10.6 million, respectively. I thank, the, uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that information. Given the growth of the availability of real-time developed applications and databases which might be shared by these emergency services. Will the Cabinet Secretary initiate a review of immediately available commercial applications which might be so applicable that even greater efficiencies can be developed in these services as a result of sharing the same data and so lower costs? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm sure the member recognises that both Police Scotland and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service have been through a significant period of uh, change over the last 18 months to two years and moving to uh, a single service in both police and in fire. And that has led to a considerable need for uh, a renewal within the ICT provision uh, and a consolidation of the various ICT uh, platforms which they have been utilising. A key part of that work has been to ensure uh, that there has uh, been a continued uh, service provided and that the quality of that service uh, was unaffected. Therefore, uh, it has been important to make sure that the integrity of the process has been maintained uh, as best as possible during uh, the changeover period. Uh, having said that, uh, and as that process is still going forward at the present moment, having said that, I do recognise that there is an opportunity for uh, a greater sharing and uh, cooperation uh, between both the uh, Police Scotland and Fire and Rescue Service in Scotland. And I have uh, no doubt that they will be interested in looking for opportunities as they move forward uh, where they can share uh, platforms and uh, data as and when uh, appropriate. And I've, uh, I can give the member an assurance that it's our desire to make sure that we not only have a, an integrated fire service, an integrated uh, police service, that, but we also make sure that our emergency services collectively uh, are working in cooperation and in partnership as and when it's appropriate for that to take place. Thanks, Dr Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Justice Subcommittee on Policing last week heard that 20,086 stop search records were lost from a Police Scotland uh, computer by somebody operating the computer and pressing the wrong button. Now, does the Cabinet Secretary share my concern that Police Scotland has such a clunky IT system that such a large volume of data can apparently be lost without any prompt or backup? And are Police Scotland getting value for money in their IT system? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think we need to separate out two different things here. Is the system which is used for the collection of stop and search data is separate from the rest of the police system. Uh, the stop and search uh, system was created specifically in order to capture that data when they were requested to do so. 
but the rest of the police system that ca captures information about offences, etc., and everything else is a separate part to that system. That works very effectively. And as a member will be aware, uh, Police Scotland are presently in the process um, with the development of uh, uh, I6, which will be rolled out next year uh, within the system, which will improve it even further in terms of its capacity. Um, and as the member did here last week, there are some issues around uh, the loss of data, but also, as uh, uh, it was explained uh, at the time, uh, a significant amount of that data has been recaptured and uh, uh, re-established. However, at the present time, uh, Her Majesty Inspector of Constabulary is also looking at the data collection process and the mechanism that Police Scotland have in place just now at the present time uh, for stop and search. And we expect that uh, report to be uh, with us by the end of March as well. So I think it's important not to just generalise it's about the IT system which the police have. This was a specific component part which had been developed specifically for collecting information. It is not the rest of the IT system uh, which the vast majority of data is collected by Police Scotland which were affected by this problem. Many thanks. And briefly, Roderick Campbell, please. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, is there anything further that you can add regarding the implementation of the I6 system? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, other than to say that the I6 system will uh, uh, increase the capacity that the uh, Police Scotland have in terms of the uh, technical ability of the IT system, for example, it will help to uh, uh, improve the way in which data is collected and also help to improve the way in which information is shared with other agencies as well. And, uh, as far as I understand, at the present time, uh, it is both on budget and on time and will help to improve uh, the capacity of Police Scotland overall. Many thanks. Question three, Paul Martin. Uh, thank you, President Officer, to ask uh, the Scottish Government how many quad bikes have been seized by Police Scotland under the Antisocial Behaviour Act 2004 in the last year. Mr Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, Section 126 of the Antisocial Behaviour etc. Scotland Act 2004 provides powers for the police to seize vehicles being used in a manner causing alarm, distress or annoyance. Information in the number of vehicle seizures broken down by vehicle type is not currently collated by Police Scotland. We have contacted Police Scotland in order to explore whether we can improve the breakdown of vehicle seizure data to allow a better understanding of the extent of the problem regarding the antisocial use of quad bikes. Martin. No, uh, President, also, apart from the issue relating to the recording of the incident itself, I uh, would pay tribute to and commend the local police inspector in my constituents, who I know has seized a number of quad bikes uh, that have been related to antisocial behaviour. Uh, there is an issue concerning the registration of quad bikes, which I think in discussions with uh, uh, Police Scotland local representatives in my constituency would find helpful, and I know in other discussions with other agencies would find that helpful as well. I wonder if the Minister would agree to, to meet with me and maybe other interested parties to discuss how we could possibly take a registration process forward to ensure that these quad bikes are regist registered to an owner uh, and at a specified address. Minister? Well, I very much share uh, Paul Martin's concern about this issue because clearly uh, it would be ideal if we could reunite uh, the owner of a quad bike once it's uh, recovered, perhaps as part of a, an action under Section 126, with the original owner. But it's very difficult for the police to identify whether a vehicle has been stolen or indeed to find the original owner of the vehicle that has been stolen. So clearly there's a, a really strong interest in making sure that happens. I have met with Mr Martin's colleague, Claire Baker, to talk about a similar issue, but I'm more than happy to meet with Mr Martin, hear his ideas about potentially what we could do to take this forward and to explain what we might propose to do in terms of working with NFUS in particular to try and uh, make sure that farmers register their vehicles and ensure they get them back when they are lost. Minister, I beg your pardon, Margaret Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I wonder if the, the Minister is aware, there, therefore, of the water. Um, it's a smart water ID system whereby chemical solutions can be sprayed on the, the quad bike um, and that helps them to be traced and returned to the owner. It's something that the NFU have promoted. And would he be in favour of promoting um, awareness of this as well? Minister. Uh, it's a bit of serendipity as it happens this morning. I was at an event uh, on metal theft and met with the smart water company in the process of that and was discussing this very issue because of quad bikes uh, and certainly would be interested to look at what the potential is using that approach. Um, if it's being supported by NFUS, that's obviously a very welcome uh, a measure on their part. But I'm keen to meet with all members who are, are, have an interest in tackling this problem because there's a lot of vehicles, a lot of money being lost to the farming industry uh, through the loss of the vehicles and anything such as smart water that can help with that. I'd be more than interested to, to look at. Many thanks. Question four, Neil Finlay. 
to ask the Scottish Government whether it will hold an inquiry into the policing and convictions of minors arrested in Scotland during the 1984-85 minor strike. Secretary Michael Baths. We have robust procedures in place within our justice system where uh, potential miscarriages of justice may be over, uh, where miscarriages of justice may have occurred. Uh, these should uh, be used in the appropriate way by anyone who considers that they have experienced a miscarriage of justice. It may be helpful to confirm that the Scottish Government has no powers to overturn convictions. It only, it's only a court that is able to do so. Uh, there are no plans to hold an inquiry either into the conduct of the police or individual criminal convictions. Uh, that does not prevent an individual from contacting the Chief Constable of Police Scotland or contacting the Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission to consider complaints. Finley. I was hoping that with a new minister we may have had a new attitude, but it appears not, because in a few weeks' time we will reach the 30th anniversary of the end of the strike. And I was hoping that the new Cabinet Secretary would give some commitment to some form of inquiry in Scotland, because 30 years on, many of these people still feel that they have been the victims of a miscarriage of justice. Uh, will the Minister not even consider looking at this again? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I've outlined to him and my predecessor outlined to him, we have a robust mechanism in place in Scotland for anyone who believes that they have been subject to a uh, miscarriage of justice for that issue to be thoroughly investigated, and that is through the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the review commission uh, which we have established. That would be the most appropriate way for that uh, to be taken forward. So if the member has any specific individuals who he is aware of that believe that they have been the subject of a miscarriage of justice, then their first port of call should be to the Commission to ask them to consider their complaint. In considering that, they will then be in a position to make a determination as to whether the matter should then be referred back to the court for consideration. That is a due process that is there, and that is the way for someone who believes that they have been the subject of a miscarriage of justice in order to have the issue considered. Many thanks. Question 5, John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how much compensation was paid out by Police Scotland and its predecessor service in each of the last three years. Cabinet Secretary. For 2012 and 2012 13, any compensation paid out was a matter for the Police Joint Boards and Unitary Authorities. For 2013 14, it is the responsibility of the Scottish Police Authority. Uh, the Scottish Police Authority's Head of Legal and Compliance has authority to settle claims up to the value of £50,000. Claims above £50,000 require the approval of the SPA Board for Settlement. Anthony? Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be familiar with the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents survey, resilience survey last year, which showed that 87 per cent of them acknowledged they were in breach of the working time regulations. These are the individuals, the most senior frontline individuals, who are making important issues about public safety. Are you in a position, Cabinet Secretary, to reassure me that there are sufficient funds to address the inevitable claims which will come from decisions being made by people overcome by sleep? in these senior positions, or ideally, are you in a position to ensure that the working time regulations are applied and enforced by Police Scotland as they should be? Well, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to preempt any claims that may be made against the SPA, and that's clearly for individual officers to uh, consider pursuing uh, when they have been provided with appropriate uh, legal advice. We are obviously in regular contact with the staff side, including uh, the Superintendents Association, to look at a whole range of issues that may be affecting their members. But if there are specific issues about the operation of Police Scotland and the way in which they are taking forward working time arrangements for uh, officers, and that is an issue that should be duly pursued through the Scottish Police Authority, who are responsible for scrutinising and also in holding Police Scotland to account for their conduct and the way in which they are operating the service. Thanks. Question 6, John Wilson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the Lord President of the Court of Session and what issues were discussed. Secretary. I met the Lord President on the 29th of January and the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs met the Lord President on the 3rd of February. Uh, a number of matters uh, relating to the judiciary uh, and the business and reform of the courts were discussed. Wilson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. 
Could I ask the Cabinet Secretary what approach has currently been taken by the Scottish Government with regard to the role of, and budget of the Judicial Complaints Reviewer and whether there have been any discussions on reviewing the powers and increased independence of the Judicial Complaints Reviewer? Um, at the present time, there has been uh, uh, no review undertaken of the uh, Judicial Complaints Reviewer's uh, role uh, or are there any plans at the present moment to consider extending the remit and the responsibility of the Judicial uh, uh, Complaints Reviewer as well. Um, I recognise the member's interest in this particular issue. If he has got particular aspects that he uh, would wish to raise with myself or uh, my ministerial colleague uh, on this particular issue, we'd be more than happy to explore that further with him. Uh, but there are uh, no further areas that have been taken forward at this present moment in the points that he's raised. Many thanks. Question 7, Ken McIntosh. Do you ask the Scottish Government whether Police Scotland plans to review its operational method known as kettling. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. As the Cabinet Secretary stated in his response to parliamentary questions from the member in January, the deployment of police officers and a decision around the use of tactical options for crowd management, including containment, is a matter for Police Scotland. Any decision to utilise containment as a tactical option is one made by the police tactical commander and is fundamentally subject to a variety of legal tests derived from stated cases. Scottish ministers expect that any use of this approach to policing is proportionate to the situation, making the measure necessary and is enforced for no longer than reasonably necessary. The Scottish Police Authority has a statutory responsibility for holding the Chief Constable to account for the policing of Scotland. Thanks. Ken McIntosh. Thank you. Can I thank the Minister for his reply? I noticed he didn't give any particular figures about the frequency of the use of kettling in Scotland. Can I ask the Minister, given the concerns that currently exist about such illiberal practices as stop and search and armed policing, is this not another area that uh, Police Scotland could review with a view to improving its relations with the general public and improving confidence in Police Scotland in, in particular? Minister. I would merely say uh, to Mr McIntosh about his first point, uh, he did not actually ask for any statistics around the, the use of, of containment, otherwise I might have been in a position to look at that. But uh, on the more substantive point about the relationship between police and the public, clearly the Police Scotland work very hard to ensure good community relations. Um, it is the important role the SPA have in terms of holding the Chief Constable to account for how policing is delivered in operational terms. Scottish Ministers do not intervene on operational matters, as I am sure Mr McIntosh will appreciate, for, for very good reasons. Um, but uh, clearly, if there are concerns about the use of containment, I would in the first instance address them to the Chief Constable if people have specific complaints and then obviously that can be taken forward in the, in the appropriate manner. Many thanks. Question 8, Animal Goldie. To ask the Scottish Government how many people supplying new psychoactive substances have been charged under common law with reckless and culpable conduct and how many convictions have resulted. Solicitor General Leslie Thompson. The common law offence of culpable and reckless conduct covers a wider range of offending than just the supply of new psychoactive substances, NPS. Figures for the number of people charged or convicted for supplying new psychoactive substances under that offence are not available. The offence of culpable and reckless conduct can be used where a person is supplied with a new psychoactive substance in certain circumstances, and in particular there requires to be evidence that the supplier knew or was reckless to the fact that the NPS was being used for human consumption. Animal Goldie. Deputy Presiding Officer, with a threat so serious as that posed by new psychoactive substances, it is deeply disappointing that the information I have requested is not available from the Scottish Government. How does it know what is going on, and in such ignorance, how can it respond to this threat? Will the Solicitor General endeavour to find out this information, and will she and the Lord Advocate liaise with the Chief Constable about issuing guidance to police officers to clarify when circumstances justify a charge of reckless and culpable conduct being brought against those who supply these dangerous substances. Solicitor General. I thank the member for her interest in a, this difficult area. Firstly, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service did issue guidance to the police in relation to an operation last year specifically covering the use of culpable and reckless and the type of evidence that would be required. Secondly, it is clear from Parliament's business bulletin published today that there will be a ministerial statement tomorrow in relation to new psychoactive substances. 
And thirdly, can I assure the member that the Crown Office were part of the NPS expert review group and are continuing to work with the police, local authority and trading standards to ensure that in this difficult area of law, culpable and reckless is used when it's appropriate and also the other types of offences, in particular under the, gener uh, under the product safety regulations, are also used when they are appropriate. Question 9, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the Cashback for Communities scheme. Sec. Michael Matheson. The Cashback programme is continuing to enhance and support communities across Scotland and particularly our young people. Cashback offers young people from all backgrounds the opportunity to be all that they can be. A wide range of projects are supported by the programme and providing young people, many from disadvantaged areas, with supported opportunities to deliver important life skills through involvement in sport, culture, youth work and youth employability schemes. Cashback will continue to strengthen our communities and to provide positive destinations for our young people. On BT, briefly, please. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary will agree with me that cashback for community scheme makes a real difference to communities. Can the Cabinet Secretary update on what funding opportunities my constituency of Mid Midlothian North and Musselburgh can anticipate over the forthcoming year? Uh, well, I can uh, assure the member that uh, his constituency in the area, uh, Midlothian area, there has been a significant financial benefit from uh, cash back. Uh, for example, uh, uh, up to 2013-14, uh, over £790,000 were invested in Midlothian, uh, delivering over uh, 41,000 activities and opportunities for uh, young people. And that investment will continue to take place as we uh, uh, continue with phase three um, of the cashback uh, programme. Uh, but given the uh, very extensive range of different programmes that I have here uh, that his, his constituency have benefited from, uh, I'd be more than happy to write to the member uh, detailing them uh, so that he is fully aware of their detail. Many thanks. And that concludes portfolio questions. And we'll now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12395 in the name of...